a beautiful phrase I heard in Spanish the other day, and I'll say it in Spanish and then I'll, I'll say it in English. It goes, no hay camino al paz. Paz es el camino. There's no road to peace. Peace is the road. It's so beautiful. We can say that about anything. Let's say happiness. There's no road to happiness. Happiness is the road. You decide, like, this is the path I'm on and I will be complete with it. There is no road to a better relationship with someone in your family. The better relationship is the road. And we're not taught this in our thinking. What we're talking about here, Lee, in a way, is converting from an outcome to a path. And Steve Jobs said this, you know, very famous from the Apple days, the journey is the reward. I don't know that he originated it, but he often said it. We are on a path that is our game of life, and it is our opportunity, and really even our responsibility to look at that path as our resistance training and our gift to finding the jewels that will lead us to that satisfaction in our life. Welcome to the Show Your Value podcast, where we explore the art of value creation in three macro buckets, material value, emotional energy value, and spiritual value. I am your host, Lee Benson, and today I have a very special guest with Ellen petrie Leance, an acclaimed Silicon Valley innovator, former Stanford University instructor, TEDx speaker, and published author. Ellen petrie Leance works at the crossroads of creative and scientific inquiry. Her career at Apple established her as a digital pioneer and the catalyst of history's first online connection between a technology company and its users. Continuing on this course, she challenged assumptions as an entrepreneur, as a leader at Google, in venture capital, and as a global innovation advisor. Ellen is the author of The Happiness Hack, a neuroscience-based guide to life satisfaction and the originator of popular Stanford courses, including The Neuroscience of Creativity and Innovation, and is a globally followed keynote speaker. She contributes articles on ethics, leadership, functional neuroscience, and gender equality to publications including Huffington Post, Business Insider, Inc.com, CNBC, Self, and Women's Health. Today, after decades of leadership, success as an entrepreneur, and time as a Stanford University instructor, she blends her unique professional experience with deep knowledge of neuroscience and human behavior. Her podcast, The Brain and Beyond, it's about awakening audiences to time-proven ways of leading, living, and maintaining mental wellness. She maintains an active Buddhist practice and is the mother of three adult sons. So Ellen, thank you so much for joining me here today. Thank you. I think I gave you the long bio. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, there, there's a lot there and, and I'm, I'm always fascinated with human behavior and how all that plays out. And I, I don't think very many people really um, think about that, you know, very intentionally. And, and I did, as I mentioned earlier, before we started, um, I, I listened to the audio uh, version of your book about a week ago, and then I went through it completely again last night and took several pages of notes and questions and things to talk about. And there, there's so much in the book to think about. And the first thing they come out is like, well, well, where would you start? But even before that, why would you start? What would be, uh, you know, what's the value in starting down this road of being more happy? So if we could begin there, what are your thoughts on why this would be so important for people to even start here? Right. The first thing I'd like to do, Lee, with that is talk a bit about the word happy, because um I think we've, even since I wrote the book, lost a little bit of a sense of what happy really means. You know, if we look globally at things like the World Happiness Index, there are entire cultures or countries that rate themselves as much more happy. And that doesn't necessarily mean they go around just, you know, we smiling all the time, happy, happy, joy, joy. However, it tends to be a little bit more of, shall we say, a, a little more lively and jovial culture than what we experience here. As you know from reading the book, happiness can take one of two branches. There can be the dopamine-fueled happiness of sort of pleasure or momentary satisfaction or success on a goal, achievement of something like, wow, I, what would it be like, you know, okay, dopamine-fueled happiness could be, oh, I got 300 likes on my Instagram post or, wow, I, uh, 
parked in front of a parking meter that had already been paid. Like that's a, those are the momentary sorts of happiness that we seem to increasingly chase in our culture right now. So I, it's sort of cause and effect related. Point A leads to point B. It's quite linear. And that serves the dopamine uh, motivation reward cycles. Real human happiness, the type we see in very happy cultures or in deeply happy people, is about a certain sense of alignment with intention or with life purpose. These people find value in life in a feeling that's more like what we would call satisfaction than it is what we call happiness. Those neurochemicals, the neurochemicals associated with satisfaction, a feeling of alignment with intention, being on track with purpose are a little bit more associated, well, maybe more than a little more associated, they're more associated with the right hemisphere and uh, neurotransmitters, neurochemicals such as uh, serotonin, for example, which is sort of the like, ah, I did it sort of feeling. It's not a spike in the same way. It's more of a flow. Yeah. And, you know, I've always thought of um, th this topic as I probably can't be happy all the time. That's unrealistic. Uh, but I, I always think of it in terms of um, fulfillment. If I had a most important number for me, it would be my internal fulfillment quotient. And is that rising over time? Uh, but the happiness piece, I, I do hear people say, if you're not happy all the time, something's wrong. And that doesn't make sense to me. I believe I can constantly grow fulfillment. But talk, talk about that. I think there's a big difference. You should, you should write a book about happiness because you've nailed it, Lee. <laughs> you are so right. There is a baseline sense that humans really flourish when they possess and cultivate it. And that is a sense of satisfaction or fulfillment. Fulfillment is sort of what I mean when I say alignment with intention. There is something that is values based that matters to us that is what we feel is sort of part of who we are and it becomes our practice to always move toward that and being happy all the time, especially when we look at the way we currently define happy is probably not either realistic or healthy because of, you know, the, the motivation reward chemicals associated with that happy, happy, joy, joy, way, and, you know, I nailed it, something like that. Uh, those when they break down chemically in the body, they aren't necessarily things that are all that healthy for the body. So people out there might be thinking, wait a minute, why would we have happiness be something that if, you know, in excess might not be that healthy? Remember, the dopamine is associated with motivation and reward. Reach up on the tree and grab a bug back on, you know, in the ancient times. Go out and get that impala or bring whatever it is home. Motivation reward, but not the types of things we can do all the time. You know, a really interesting analog is in ancient human societies, generally speaking, hunter-gatherers, it turns out, and there's so amazing what science can show us these days, you know, with the analysis of, you know, molecular analysis of bone samples, you know, fossils and so forth. But it turns out that about 80% of nutrition in ancient human societies came from gathering and 20%, a very, very important 20% came from hunting. As I think about it, to me, that's probably the right balance of serotonin and dopamine. We should be on steady state, working toward fulfillment. Something difficult comes along, we have a hard time, we sink down, we're sad, we're angry, we're hurt, we're heartbroken, whatever it is. But we come back to, hey, this was great, something else made me happy. Our 80% should be a focus on our value right? Our spiritual value, our, our social value, what we mean, how we matter in the circles we care most about. And then also, of course, the creation of value in our life, which is a, you know, it's a lifelong steady build. But those 20% big, we happy moments, those are more like what you hunt than what you gather. Yeah, that, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. And it, you know, kind of, kind of back to this foundational. Why, why is it important to even start down this road and figure it out? And I don't think, to your point in the book, very many people really think about it intentionally and really work on it in a very, you know, very mindful and intentional way. What would be the value if more people got on this road and went to it? Like, why they should should they even do it? Mm -hmm. The first thing I want to say, and I say this often in my coaching practice, because 
people know that something's off. This is my strong belief. You know, you, you, there's something, something is not right internally. And of course we could talk about the external world, but many people feel something's not right. And they can be very self-deprecatory, very self-critical about, you know, uh, I don't do this or something, or why don't I, why am I not more mindful or something like that? I always have to remind myself and others how could we be? We were never taught these things. These were never upheld as important in our culture, in our values or society. It's happening a little bit more now, but mind you, our early childhood minds shape what we believe is real in our life. That's what creates our systems of beliefs, of biases, biases being mental shortcut to speed processing time, help us make decisions faster. So how, how would we know any other way, really, in fairness to all of us? go over to Bhutan and people know another way and through their whole lives, they're happier. They've been taught this. It's been nurtured in them since they were tiny children. But let's come back. Why does this matter? Because it's a super important question. You know, I was reading a book the other day that I don't fully agree with, but it was saying like everything in life is neurochemistry. So materialist neuroscience believes that it's all just, it's like a machine. The computer analogy is like, a, it's a really good analogy for the brain until you tell a materialist neuroscience or ask a material neuroscience, oh, that's great. Makes perfect sense to me. Where's it plugged in? <laughs> Every computer has to plug into some sort of power source, right? They don't like me very much when I pull that one. But yeah, right? The brain works differently in different emotional states or scenarios. So when I am feeling satisfied and fulfilled, I have a little bit more of an all systems go opportunity in my brain for it to map across, you know, many places, many synaptic uh, paths, pathways and functional areas of the brain because every part of the brain functions differently. And I am able to access more of my brain when I am in a steady state. The minute that my switch flips to time pressure to uh, someone looking over my shoulder, to someone telling me I did a bad job, to having ambient stress for other reasons. Certain parts of the brain are limited neurochemically. It's fascinating, actually. <clears throat> what I speak about here is what many people title, like even a mini fight or flight response. And in any sort of stress scenario associated with the fight or flight response, which is actually a little bit different than many of us have been taught, but talk for another day. Um, the amygdala sends out a chemical signals very quickly into the brain that vasoconstrict, meaning they constrict certain veins in the brain, reducing blood flow to the prefrontal cortex, which is the home of our highest human cognition. This is the place where intentional thought, values-oriented thinking, uh, long-term, to some extent long-term, the right hemisphere also does a lot of long-term, but really like if then scenarios, on the other hand, scenarios, thinking about our impact on others. This is where we become very mindful, right, of the way we want to think in the world. This all gets cut off when we're hungry, tired, afraid, lonely, stressed, said pretty much everybody at this time and place. I mean, we can look at many of those things almost as epidemics right now. You know, stress has been named by our wonderful Surgeon General as a mate. I mean, excuse me, loneliness is an epidemic. Many people report stress. I'll bet there are people, it's the day before Thanksgiving holiday in the United States today, or, you know, what we call Thanksgiving holiday. There are many people out there who are probably beeping at each other and making hand gestures, you know, trying to get to whatever they need to go out and buy or do today, right? All of these things are part of our life, and we have to accept everything affects the brain. You know, you read in my book, and you can tell I love this stuff, your brain is a survival technology. It exists to keep you safe and alive. And in order to keep you safe and alive, it is going to look back on everything that has allowed you to survive through the history of your life, which it has documented with exquisite precision. And it's going to tell you, keep doing those things you've already done, because the evidence is in, you're here. It'll keep you, this will keep you safe and alive which is what makes change hard, which is what makes waking up and going, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense anymore. Your brain doesn't have any evidence that new and novel thoughts or intentions or new ways of thinking will serve you staying safe and alive. Now, there's some good brain hacks we can do for that, but we can explore those if you wish. 
And my, uh, my biggest takeaway from this part of the conversation, um, in the work that I do, I'll lead meetings with, you know, it could be eight or more CEOs in the room and we're all about creating more value for each other. And if something pops into my head about something I just figured out somehow is going sideways, all of a sudden that becomes a distraction. So you're, you're making the point that the fight or flight part of the brain, um, for all the reasons, can easily hijack and completely take over being present and ultra creative and everything else. So some of the work that I do is pushing that aside, understanding it, being fully present here. There's nothing I can do about it, but that's something that takes a lot of time to actually get fairly good at. But you really make the, the point of it's, it's designed for survival to take over, but it's taking over for the wrong reason. And so how do you, you know it. how do you, how do you how do you figure that out, right? You're right. There's nothing in our evolution that allowed us to separate a sense a, a threat to our survival uh, if, to differentiate it from a threat to our sense of of self, to our identity, to our ego. Call it what you will. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna answer your question because there there's things that we can do. I'm only gonna modify one word that you said. It's, you said something like it takes a lot of work to correct that. It's so natural. It's so easy. This is why I call mindfulness remindfulness. It's we simply have to remember, and you already have the math on this because I told you. You know when we vaso constrict, we reduce the blood flow to the front of the brain, which means it gets less oxygen. So the easiest hack in the world is to take a breath. Bring in one breath, you're adding more oxygen, a deep and intentional breath, one inhale, adding more oxygen to your bloodstream. So right now I'm breathing. It's not intentional. My, you know, my, my, uh, something in my medulla oblongata is firing right now and keeping me breathing, you know, all of that, something in the midbrain. Watch this. I'm going to shift gears. Okay. With that, I've just deepened the amount of oxygen that comes into my body. Nobody noticed. It took one second. Nobody knows I did it. My brain is working differently because of that oxygen. When I lead meetings or workshops or whatever else, and I notice that people are getting like a little agitated or a little stressed, one of the things we do is we can just pause for a moment. Just there's a hand signal and just everybody just takes one deep breath and everything changes. It's really incredible. The other thing I want to say about fight or flight, and this is on a podcast a couple of episodes ago, one about hormones, neurohormones, the hormones and how they affect the brain. You know, when the research was done on fight or flight back decades, decades, like 70 or something, I think 70 years ago at Harvard, it came out with this incredibly conclusive analysis of the fight or flight response and how that is a vestige of our early survival and how it shows up today. It was research at Harvard. About 10 years ago, another researcher who was a woman took a look at that study. She was looking to really glean some deep information from it. She noticed something very unusual. She noticed that all of the research subjects were men, which was not uncommon at that time, right? So she replicated the entire study with all women of the same age, same demographics, blah, 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 very similar attributes except for gender. And she came up with a very different outcome. Now, before I share that outcome, I'm going to tell you, you and I both have the same neurochemicals in our brain. We both have the, you know, the androgen sort of male oriented testosterone and all of the other related hormones. And then we also have the things more related to estrogen and, you know, the other sort of female hormones. We have our own variants. There's vasopressin, which is the male kind of bonding hormone, a little bit different than the female bonding hormone, which is oxytocin. Wait. Yeah, oxytocin, that's it. But we both have them, just mixing and blending them in different ways. So what I'm about to tell you doesn't mean that women are not capable of fight or flight, because trust me, we are. <laughs> Everybody knows that. However, our primary tendency under amygdala hijack, under stress, is toward tend and befriend. Look at different ways to fix the problem and then connect with the people where friction might be happening in order to find a shared solution. So men are very capable of this as well. Very, very capable of this as well. However, I think in a society where for decades we've been taught when you get under pressure, you fight or you flee, right? That's conditioned and trained us to have that sort of stress response. 
Whereas taking a pause, all of us know it's also available to go, wait a minute, what's really happening here? Which is much more of a tender of a friend response. Hmm. I, I love that. And I, I think about everything now and I, it's, it's been sort of years of cultivating for me. Uh, but how do I take any situation, even if it's super stressful, leverage it to create more value in the future? And I think about all three buckets, material, emotional, spiritual value. And even when somebody else is not acting in a, a very nice way, however you want to describe that, me remaining respectful, honest, straightforward, thinking through that value creation lens, um, I almost always come out the other side able to create even more value. It's a, I, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I, yeah, just to kind of finish the thought. Um, most of my work is about um, creating value within organizations of any type or any size. How do we, you know, accelerate the value, increase the value for everyone, all stakeholders in all three buckets? Um, I've also started playing in how do we operationalize value creation within families? Same thing. Get the kids thinking about it this way, because I believe the purpose of an education is to create value in the world, not get a good grade, get a diploma, get a degree, get a job in that system. Um, that we have mostly today, kids are doing what they think they're supposed to do instead of discovering what they were meant to do, which is a big part of what I got, got out of your, out of your book. And, and so this, um, this whole concept of value creation and there's the top, you know, 1%, 2% of, you know, sort of uh, more intellectual thinkers and conversations and understanding it as I'm getting into trying to do this within families the vast majority here in the United States um, and certainly around the world are middle and low income families. So a lot of them are just struggling to make ends meet. And, you know, with this with this setup, what will work? What lanes will work um, to get them moving in the right direction, get on the right track if they don't have time to really you know, read a bunch of books and, and, and think through all of it? What would be your advice on where do they where do they start? This is a whole, this is a, a day long walk and talk conversation. And so we have to really zoom out when we hear this at the expectations and sort of social contracts that our culture, our society have created. You use the term twice, you know, make ends meet. And there's some, you know, I'm in my sixties and having watched, I grew up in a, you know, wonderful family, uh, in a, lovely, simple neighborhood, you know, all of this, it wasn't hardship, but I didn't see at that time, I mean, it was a great life, but there weren't the divides that we see in our culture right now. And in my witnessing, my interpretation from my limited perspective and biases, I'm only speaking for myself, I can't speak for everyone, is I have seen an increasing pressure for people to achieve and perform which may not mean to create value, as you so well said, and then also to, you know, this sort of making ends meet. I think that there has been the creation of a really profound scarcity mentality that there is no such thing as enough. And this is absolutely the home turf of the left hemisphere of the brain, a very important part of the brain, but that is on linear pursuit of outcomes. You know, there's a famous book called Thinking Fast and Slow. This tends to be the fast brain. And I love to say this is the left hemisphere. This is the right. I don't know if, you know, Zoom flips these things around or whatever, you know, whatever cameras flip them around. Okay. The, the left thinks it's right, even when it's wrong. We are meant as humans to have balanced brains. And every long surviving human culture had active practices that, you know, we don't have to teach people to cultivate balance of the mind so that over life we created a sense of perspective and wisdom that is not valued or conditioned or taught in our society. So we're fast thinking right now. And that is inherently, I need something I don't have. I like to talk about this hemisphere as more, 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 mine, 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 now, 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 new, new, new. And this has been increasingly, I would say, psychologically and culturally elevated in our culture, even on my watch in my lifetime, and then our increasing reliance on the dopamine motivated loops of reward and uh, of, of motivation and reward in technology stimulates those same systems in ways that break down into stress hormones. Very interesting. But also that, you know, it's, dopamine is the, the, the neurotransmitter. It's the chemical of addictive behavior. You know, that there's mm -hmm. never enough. So I believe in our culture, this has been really cultured in. And then because the brain will do more of it's ever, whatever it's doing right now, 
which maps to, well, if she's using her phone all day, that must be what it means to keep her safe and alive. I'd better keep her doing it, right? This is what we've been roped into. Now, I skirted your question, though. And so, but here is where I would begin. You know, you talk about value. It is my strong belief that in corporations, in any system, in families and individuals, the creation of value begins with values. What matters to us? And with all the noise and the stress, and you can take this as neuroscience as well, all the noise and the stress, the prefrontal cortex, which I mentioned earlier, really is about our highest and most intentional human forms of thinking, I think is sort of pretty largely dialed down or offline in our culture because of the amount of stress people are under. And so a family um, or an individual or even a company, I've, I, one of the companies that I'm working with right now is young, stra- scrappy and hungry and kind of likes it that way. They don't stress themselves. They don't want to grow too fast. They're slow and steady. They're creating value for all of their employees. They have happy employees who want to stay and who contribute highly. They are not on a chase, right? They're getting, they're gathering. They're not hunting. <laughs> and for them, it's working, but it's values based. And the first value is one about how they interact with other people. The second value is one about their impact on the environments that they influence. This is what matters. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, it seems to me that's where they build that internal uh, fulfillment, satisfaction and, and, uh, you know, feel better about all of this and, and happier, even a higher percentage of the time. What, what I'm also noticing in some of the low and middle income families that I'm tracking um, as we're trying to operationalize value creation within families. And I, I wrote another book with my co-author, Scott Donnell, around this titled Value Creation Kid, The Healthy Struggles Your Children Need to Succeed, is that a lot of them, um, even though they're struggling, you know, food prices have pretty much literally doubled or more here in the last three or four years. Um, they seem to be happier to me. And I think it's because of the connectedness. You know, they're not on this treadmill trying to, you know, more, more, more and, and competing over there so much. It's like, this is what we have. This is a family. We hunker down. This is what we're, we've been dealt with. This is a, a, a struggle. And they seem to be happier. And I think it's your whole point in the book about connectedness being maybe one of the most important, if not the most important factor in happiness. So talk about that a little bit. You are so right. So families that are connected and very specifically families that are intergenerationally connected tend to flourish. Um, you know, our metric in this culture, in this country is primarily economic wealth creation, right? And you, you speak about this in your work that it's only one of the forms of values, but maybe you had the chance to see a Netflix series. that's called the blue zones. Did you happen to hear of this? I haven't. I'm going to write oh, that it's, down. I'll synopsize it for you. It's absolutely wonderful. So the guy who went in to do the series was just terrific. You know, he'd been a, a competitive athlete and he was really interested in well-being and longevity. And so he looked at the blue zones, which are the blue zones are the places across the planet where people live the longest, right? Where, where people very often older than a hundred. And he went in to go and I think his motivation was primarily to find, okay, what do they eat that allows them to be so healthy and so forth. When he went in and he started looking around at these blue zones, he saw a lot of other, there's a lot more than longevity going on. There's a lot of mental health going on. There was not the same levels of the, I won't name them, but the common aging associated mental health concerns and physical health concerns. They were not present in these cultures in the way they're present, even in our younger people in our cultures. My favorite scene in the movie is in Hokkaido, which is probably the world's most astonishing blue zone. And everyone thinks it's because of the purple potatoes that they eat that are really high in uh, oh, antioxidants and a certain beta something or another. But he watched these people are just having so much fun together. They're First of all, the elderly people, they're out there gardening every day. They get down on their knees. They dig in the earth. It's just what they do every day to nourish themselves. They have family members come over. They live in close proximity to each other. They don't drive for an hour and a half commuting to work, right? They're connected. And they there's so much appreciation 
of who older people are. It's just really delightful to see this woman who I think is 103 picks up a sake bottle. I don't know if it's empty or full and she balances it on her, you know, adorable head and she just does this silly little dance and stuff and everyone is just delighting in her. And you can tell she loves it. They go to Greece and they hear all of these people saying in this one little island in Greece, we love her. She keeps, she gives us perspective, you know. So, you know, the, the, the little, you know, men 98 years old are still tending the goats or the sheep or something. Now, I don't want to be artificially or unrealistically, you know, saying, aha, that's it. Or say, we should all go back to, you know, tending goats or plant, well, planting gardens is pretty great, but another story. But what the, the, the person who led this series had, and he had, you can almost see his aha moment. He goes, this isn't about the food. Food's great. Let's pay attention to it. This is about belonging. This is about connection. This is about being part of something greater, bigger than yourself. If we human, we can flourish. And a lot of times in these families that we go, we say they struggle because they don't have the economic means that, you know, some of us are very, very fortunate to have, you know, a certain level of confidence and security that we're going to be okay, you know, at least under the current paradigm. But they have something that I think we've lost. I, I, I worked in Africa a number of years ago, about a decade ago. And when I came back, it had been a, a challenging situation there. And I came back and somebody, you know, made some comment about, you know, the poor, the poorest of the poor, something like this. And after coming back from that trip, I thought, you know, when I hear a comment like this, when I sit even in a room like this, I feel we have our own type of poverty. And it's a poverty of community connection and really an understanding that life is about something bigger than our pursuit. So I offer that as a reflection on what you asked about these families having a different level of happiness than, you know, we might see elsewhere. Yeah. And ideally that's the best form of value. It's, it, it is the fulfillment. It's the connectedness, everything, everything going on within, within the family, you know, certain communities and all the wealth in the world is, I mean, it's easy to say it, um, isn't going to make you happy in any way, shape or form, but I, I, I believe, yeah, in, in trends. It's the opposite. And, and a lot of times, absolutely the opposite. It's, it's kind of, kind of crazy to watch, um, as it's going on. Um, what, one of the things that I, I've kind of learned over time is to trust the struggle. And, you know, people ask, Hey, where'd you get your start? And I'm on my seventh company. I've started from scratch. I've had some big exits, um, well into nine figures. And I keep doing the work because I love the work. It's like taking my brain to the gym every day. But I got my start pulling weeds in the late 60s for 25 cents an hour. And I struggled um, with that capability. And then I, I uh, you know, built my self-confidence and I used it to create value. And then I shoveled snow and mowed lawns and restaurant work. And, and it just kind of kept growing. And as I went through this sort of value creation struggle cycle, of seeing a capability I wanted, struggle to get it, build confidence, don't stop, use it to create value and take bigger and bigger steps. Actually, I love the struggle. You know, it's and and why is why have we gotten to this place where, oh, it's hard, we don't want that, we need to make it easy, instead of hard actually is developing you. It's 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 uh it's an incredible thing. So talk about that a little bit because I think we've lost our way here and how we think about struggle. I trust it. And, and the harder it gets, sometimes I get a warm feeling inside and smile and go, this is going to be so good when I come out the other side. <laughs> yeah, it's so great. So you and I have something in common. And my first uh, wage was 25 cents an hour, too. And it was so empowering, you know. I mean, I remember saving up and buying something for $4 and feeling like such a rock star. <laughs> it was great. You know, the thing is, I do pay a lot of attention to words. And very often in my client work, I identify the times when people use the word struggle. Because remember, what your brain identifies as a struggle, it's going to be saying, well, struggle keeps them safe and alive. I'll keep them struggling. That's a little different from the way you use the word. You use it kind of like I use resistance training. I actually believe that one of the reasons that we are here as humans is for resistance training. 
We're here. You know, I was speaking with my brother a couple of weeks back. We had such a great conversation. He's an entrepreneur, very, you know, very well known and successful entrepreneur. And we were talking. He'd be really angry with me though if I, if he heard me say that. So I won't let him listen to this podcast. So, um, what he said, we, we started talking about kind of the RPG, the role playing game of life. And in any moment in life, we're put into a room. Now I don't play video games. But I've seen my sons play them. I've seen other people say them. I have a basic sense of what they are. We're put in this RPG called life, let's just say, and we're put into different rooms to be tested, to see what we're able to learn, to see what we're capable of, and also to find the jewel. You know, I've, I think in many rooms, there might be something in the corner and you don't know if it's going to be useful or not as you go forward. But sometimes if you pick it up, it's the way you really graduate from that room and you have a tool or you have a, an asset or a resource that you can use as you go forward. I think that life is about collecting jewels, not in some greedy hoarding way, but to find the treasure, to find the jewel in even the adversity that has, um, been presented to us, you know, we're all facing some sort of challenge or struggle. Let's just own it. That's what life is like right now. And we are all facing the likely scenario that that trajectory will continue. I am so lucky to live in the land where I live. I live in New Mexico. And one of the things I love about living here is there's a lot of long held wisdom from traditional cultures in this land. And I love to read about those cultures. I love to go and hear storytelling. I love to hear the sense making that these long held philosophies, indigenous philosophies have. And it is always about the practice of life of navigating opportunity and adversity, finding satisfaction in the path rather than in the outcome and seeing yourself as something bigger. A beautiful phrase I heard in Spanish the other day, and I'll say it in Spanish and then I'll, I'll say it in English. It goes, no hay, no hay camino al paz. Paz es el camino. There's no road to peace. Peace is the road. It's so beautiful. We can say that about anything. Let's say happiness. There's no road to happiness. Happiness is the road. You decide, like, this is the path I'm on and I will be complete with it. There is no road to a better relationship with someone in your family, right? The better relationship is the road. And we're not taught this in our thinking. And so what we're talking about here, Lee, in a way, is converting from an outcome, right, to a path. And Steve Jobs said this, you know, very famous from the Apple days, the journey is the reward. I don't know that he originated it, but he often said it. We are on a path that is our game of life. And it is our opportunity and really even our responsibility to look at that path as what is our resistance training and our gift to finding the jewels that will lead us to that satisfaction in our life. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I like the option of intentionally choosing to enjoy, um, in, enjoy and be most fulfilled from what I'm doing right now, the the, the journey, if you will. And, and if we can't be happy with that, how will we ever be happy? Because it'll always be a next step we're looking for. And so many you know, folks have talked about that concept, but just saying intentionally, I want to be on the happy path. I'm not going to be on the skeptical, you know, cynical path. Skeptical, the other side. cynical is going to, it's going to, it's going to, that's a, the neurochemistry of that. Just it's, it's, that's where our polarization is. That's where a lot of other things are. This is where we categorize and classify right, wrong, black, white, nice, mean, you know, whatever. Now, that said, this is really important. I go through times where I'm bummed out. I go through times where I feel like, where, how is this all going to make sense? I definitely face obstacles, you know. I'm a human like everybody else. I have learned over the course of my life, and I would love to offer it to anyone who is earlier in the course of their life, just to be with those times and breathe with them and to remember nothing is permanent. Everything is impermanent. Happy, happy, joy, joy is impermanent. It's really fun when it happens. Really feeling down and feeling the weight of the world. It's all impermanent. We have to come back to the path. The path is always about what we value, what matters, our connections, our alignment with intention and purpose. Yeah, I, I think a lot about as I cultivate, you know, myself to create more value in the world, I think about uh, virtue and I think about mind intent and my my purpose for being here, uh, 
you know, I think foundationally is to spread this whole concept of value creationism in the world, um, communities, individually, all of it. But to me, it's elevating human consciousness, starting with my own. In other words, the more stuff I figure out, the, the more value I can create in the world, the easier certain things get. However, when you're on that road, I notice a lot of sort of emotional, I'll call it resistance training now <laughs> going on because that's where a lot of my struggle will be really, you know, digging in and figuring that out. And I just love what happens over time as I keep going through that. And I go in and out of, of sort of being happy. Uh, but I think our mind intent, what are we really trying to accomplish? Is it creating value or are you elevating consciousness, figuring more things out, whatever that is, and then and then try to practice everything. And this is how I think about real virtue, because I think, unfortunately, a super high percentage of the world are more in the virtue signaling camp than they are the actual virtue camp. And that if you practice real virtue, you're leaning in to create value in the world intentionally. And at the same time, um, I look at it and say, I have to be leaning in equally to push things back that are taking value out of the world, micro to at scale. And so I think about doing both intentionally and, and, um, and, and almost measurably really in, in a lot of ways uh, to get out of the virtue signaling camp. You know, when, when some people say, oh, this person has too much money, they shouldn't have it. If I had that money, I would do this. I view that as a form of virtue signaling. And I would say if somebody has a lot of money and power practicing with virtue, it creates value in the world at scale. So this, this is kind of a bigger thing, but that, that's how I think about it. Virtue and, and mind intent around elevating human consciousness. What are your thoughts as I kind of go through that? This is what I've been working on. Yeah, it's a wonderful articulation. And what came up for me is when you talk about, you know, uh, intent, virtue, and consciousness, those are all inside all of us, right? The potential for that is all inside of us. When we're signaling, you even hear it in the word, we're doing something so that something on the outside, not the inside, is affected or blamed or changes, changed. I think it's really useful to reflect on what is really happening inside and then how that changes as we put it outside. And so much of what the left hemisphere does, <laughs> I'm, I like to say, you know, that phrase, it's just when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Well, I'm a hammer because I see everything through the lens of how the hemispheres are out of balance. That's just my way of looking at, I, I won't say making sense of the world, but witnessing the world because it doesn't always make sense to me. But really all of these things where there's, there's more show than there's go when there's reactivity, when there's drama, really like we could so get into that. All of that is about externals. It's about trying to find our place in a world around that is confusing. And by the way, in a world that's only getting more confusing, in my opinion, that game is going to get harder, which is why what you're talking about, alignment with intention, virtue, an understanding that human consciousness is here to rise, because I, do, I believe consciousness is here to rise, maybe not only human, all of that is internal. You know, it's, it's a funny thing. When we leave our house to go out into the world, we tend to make sure that the burners are turned off and that we brought the things that we're going to need. We take care of what's inside before we can go out to the outside. At least that's what I've seen work better. I think it's the same with ourselves. Yeah, I love the stronger we are on the inside, the less the outside can impact us if it's extrinsically motivated. And I, I look at kids today and how many TikTok likes did I get and oh, my part of exactly. this love or something else. Yeah. And if they could make their primary, um, you know, pick the language that works, but primary identity, purpose, drive, the value they create in the world, all of a sudden their identity around externally motivated things like I'm a, a sports star or I'm this or I'm that. Uh, now, if something were to happen where they couldn't be that thing anymore, it wouldn't matter because internally they're creating material, emotional energy or spiritual value, and they just shift it a little bit. Mm -hmm. I also think it's a really interesting theme that there's so much to explore there. But when I think of value, I often think, what is this? This is me speaking as an elder now. It wasn't always like this for me. I think there's been a shift in what is the value I create in the world, which is my own impact and agency and, you know, my own experience to the, the value I can offer to the world. 
uh, as we look at, you know, a, an aging process, there really are changes that come across that become more of being of service and of offering something to those who will follow. And so my way of seeing the world is much more about uh, an offering than a creation. And that might sound a little subtle, yet I think it's really important to know that there are different ways that we can be of value in our lifetime through different chapters in our uh, different seasons of life. Okay. I, I, I love that. And that drives by far within me, the biggest um, increase in fulfillment, internal satisfaction, and all of that is, you know, getting this, I, I call it win-win value creation out into the world. So I'm being of service. I'm offering things. I, I kind of go out into the world and develop everybody appropriately given the situation at any point in time to, to elevate um, emotional energy, which to me is the scarcest commodity on the planet when it's running on nine precious. or 10. The most my precious. arm could fall off. I've got another one. I'm good. If it's running on zero or one, I get a flat tire and it runs my whole week, you know? So um, I think even though I've done really well on the material side, I think the emotional energy piece is probably uh, my, my strongest value creation superpower in, you know, leading teams and, you know, passionately talking about what's possible and engaging everybody in productive ways of getting there. I want that to be a lot more infectious than dwelling on or admiring problems uh, in, in there. So I, you know, I, to, to, to your point, I feel the best when I'm doing that, when I'm of service or however you want to say that I, I call it, you know, sort of creating value in the world. And I want to do it at scale, make, make value creation cool as a culture in the United States and then the entire world. I don't think we're even creating 10% of what we could be creating uh, because of, I, I, I just say flat out really uh, poor leadership um, in, in, in governments around the world and in a lot of larger companies. But what if value creation became cool? It became the culture and everybody latched onto that. That would be, that would be just, Absolutely incredible. I'm not sure the best way. Do we have a bunch of leaflets we drop and say, hey, please do this. It'll be better. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's, that's really funny. So a really neat way to think about what you said is not that would be, but that will be. Because I think we're at a tipping point where we're realizing that what's gotten us here will not get us there. And the methods that allowed us to exploit some short-term pursuits. And, you know, we have to look across the whole lens of human history. Short-term can be a couple hundred years, a couple decades, you know, whatever. It doesn't only mean next quarter. But there, our short-term thinking has caught up with us. And I like to say, I don't like to say, however I do say, um, we're living in a world that is shaped as much by unintended consequences as it is by anything else. We are dealing with the repercussions of things where short-term thinking is showing now its dark side. So in offering value to the world, in creating value in the world, what I really heard you speak about, Lee, was the sense of generosity and really a sense of sort of uh, interbeing, you know, where we come to an awakening where we realize that all of our actions are of consequence and that if we, A, think through the consequence um, beforehand, we may act with more responsibility, generosity, accountability, a higher offer to the evolution of, 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 of human meaning that I know everyone longs for in their heart. I really believe that. And then the other thing we do is we, um, we start working together in a more connected way where we see ourselves as less as individuals. Right now, I'm doing some research on the rise of individuality in American culture, very specifically in our culture, or Western culture, because our culture has become, largely through technology, I think the most influential culture on the planet. And um, the rise of individuality is, it, you really, based on the research, takes a huge upspike after World War II. And you see this in the way that we developed houses and the way we even started serving food. I mean, it's just so my portion for me, you know, was, I, I, as I said, I've been lucky to travel at different parts in the world where even, you know, people eating from a collective plate are symbolically and subconsciously interconnecting in ways that 
you know, we get, we get our happy meal in a bag or whatever, and that's mine, right? So, but the, the thing about individuality is in the early sixties, there was a Time magazine cover story that was called the me generation. And so this meanness that we have conditioned and culture and created in our society is a very big part of what you're talking about and coming back to the generosity of interconnection. And now I have to be true to myself because I say, Hey, it's all here to teach us, right? It's all resistance training. I really believe that the causes and conditions that have led us to this moment in time are exactly what we need to find the jewel. I don't always feel as hopeful as I would like to feel yet. I always feel hopeful. I recognize that there are dark times. I also recognize that we humans are really good when we pause, when we take a breath, when we look at somebody else in the eyes, when we remain curious using the prefrontal cortex. We are such incredible problem solvers. If that weren't true, we wouldn't be here today. We've made it through 300,000 or more years of things that I know I couldn't survive. But, you know, our ancestors made it through adversity because of the very resources still embedded in our beings. And now it's time to expand what those are. They're not about the individualistic chase. They are about the very things we saw in that Blue Planet show, which is being part of something bigger than ourselves in a way that creates connection and even creates happiness as well as well-being and fulfillment. Yeah, I, I agree a hundred percent that we are at a very necessary part of our evolution as as a you know global culture society. It, as a species, we have we as a species we 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 have to go through this. Um, I've always believed, and I still believe it today, that we can protect and strengthen both the individual and the community and. The, the way I am, I, I think about the term selfishness. Every time it comes up, it always has sort of a negative spin on it. But I believe everybody does what's in their best self-interest for this life or the next life. So everybody, by definition, is selfish. But are you win-win or are you win-lose? And the way I approach the world, um, let's develop everybody. Let's create value everywhere we can. Uh I don't expect anything in return, um, but what's happening as a side effect of all of this is it exposes me to opportunities, way more opportunities than I otherwise would have. And then I can choose to play or not play in those different things. So I'm protecting and strengthening um, myself as an individual, um, but also I see this huge value in community. So I think about both and I we're probably saying exactly the same yeah. thing, but how would you, how would you, yeah. I, I, I really agree. There's a beautiful saying from this one. It says, together we rise. And, you know, every individual, first of all, everything we do affects everything. <laughs> it's, you know, this is like the butterfly effect is kind of real, you know? So we have to remember we are of impact. So how do we intentionally want to be of impact? I do agree with you. I, I don't see any negative spin with selfishness. I think it's been poorly branded, you know, it needs a selfishness needs a rebrand. And even if it doesn't get rebranded, we can only do behavioral economics is all that we can only do what we feel serves us at the moment that we do it. That's just, a, it's just part of the way we work. So um, I think both are important, getting the inside right with the individual grounding and the, the sense of intention, the virtue that you mentioned, the really the thrill to think that we are part of some adventure, some role-playing game RPG of consciousness where we get to find jewels, learn, have training for perhaps part of some bigger picture that we will never know what that bigger picture is. We don't know what's in the future rooms, you know, that's the way it works. But then also using everything we've generated internally to be of connection and of service to something larger than ourselves. And that actually helps folks uh, like doing these things. If somebody were to say, you know, they're hundred percent money motivated, they want to achieve this or, you know, level of wealth being the way you and I are talking about it in my experience creates more material wealth, but it's also creating wealth in the other two buckets on the emotional and spiritual side. So it's, it's always been interesting to me that they don't see that and and therefore limit themselves significantly because they're just playing it's, it primarily in one bucket. It's, it's so it's I I've seen this time and again. And the thing is is getting on the chase which is the pursuit of material wealth. 
you know, first of all, I have seen some people who I would consider like, oh my goodness, like, I mean, like, why, you know, that type of thing. And I've also seen some people who really, really do it the right way, who don't necessarily meet that level of material success that they might have been wanting. So there's some luck in this. And I think that, you know, they say luck equals preparedness meeting opportunity. You know, I have been prepared for opportunities that I don't think have come to me yet, you know, and may or may not come to me. I'm at the point now where that doesn't frustrate me anymore. I see it as a part of the dance of life. We're not in control of everything. However, when people are only chasing that material goal, here is something really important I've noticed. They never get there. There is something that they're seeking that they think the material goal will fulfill. But when they get there, because they're not emotionally or spiritually connected, grounded, whole, complete, aligned with intention, values based, they think that they are, that the problem is just they need to go out and get more money. And by the way, this largely is like how consumerism works as well. I mean, let's just name it like, oh, you know, I'll just buy that one more whatever it is and then I'll be happy. No, that doesn't work. Wrong reward chemistry. <laughs> so I'm 100% aligned with what you're saying and feel really glad that this message is coming to the world in your voice and in, in so many others that I believe are starting to get it. What's gotten us here will not get us there. Yeah. I think more of us like you and I, and there, I think there are thousands and the numbers are growing, need to be speaking about this and helping others, you know, kind of work through it. If you're going to chase something, chase internal fulfillment, but don't chase it, cultivate it and be happy with the journey and celebrate, Absolutely. celebrate what's actually going on. Right. 100%. And there's something I often say in my work, it, it's good news. 5% changes are huge. You know, there are so many people who think they have to change everything in order to get it right. I think that's an, a reflection on how many false promises certain things in our culture, society, economic system and so forth have given us. So you don't have to change everything. 5% change. If all you started doing was breathing before responding, taking one breath before responding, if all you started doing was really tapping into that innate birthright of being curious, like really kind of having some, you know, huh, before I say what is, I'm going to consider other perspectives, you know, just really, I wonder what else might be possible, just that beautiful curiosity, which is what I taught at Stanford is really the art of curiosity. Another thing is if all we do is go out into nature, because we are biological beings that came up through, you know, hundreds of thousands of years and millions before that in nature. If all we do is go out and really look at nature and get curious, like a friend of mine asked the question, nature, what will you teach me today? So, you know, I might go out to nature and say, uh, I might see the way the birds gather around the little, you know, water pot I put out there for them. Oh, I see that some birds are simpatico with each other and tend to be together. I see that some don't get along. Huh, I wonder what that might teach me today. I mean, we, we become more porous to what this life really is. We become better at gathering what really matters rather than chasing one dangle out there that we've been told is the prize. I think the reason that we're reaching so many of us reaching for that one prize is because we have somehow received a message that this moment itself, this opportunity to be here, that's the prize. Yeah. Well, in the current system, I believe people are doing what they think they're supposed to do. Uh, unlike what I said earlier, let's help them. Let's create a better system where they discover what they're really meant to do. I, I've got um, one, one other question before we wrap up here. And you and I, I believe, could talk for a week straight around all of this. This is so fascinating to me. Um, in the book, you talk about the difference between loneliness and solitude and what I notice about myself is when I spend time alone, 80, 90% of the time I recharge and it's incredible. And this whole concept of doing nothing, all of a sudden it's like this dot connection dance that I can use later that happens in my brain. And I feel like I get more creative and I write songs and there's all kinds of things that I do. Uh, but for some people, when they're alone, it takes them down a really dark place the majority of the time and they don't recharge. What's going on there? Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing we have to acknowledge is that every person is unique. We're all wired differently. 
The second thing we have to acknowledge is that human beings are, by definition, by biology, social animals. You know, a significant part of real estate in our brain, at the very heart of the brain, the very center, is the limbic system. And largely, it's about social context, social interweavings, and things that happen in the causes and effects with the way we interact with others. But I think there's a bigger issue, and you, in your words, you articulated it really well. Um, earlier in this conversation, you said connection. You spoke about the importance of connection. The difference to me between loneliness and solitude is that in solitude, we are connected to something that is of meaning and fulfillment and purpose for us, something that might be larger than ourselves. So if I were to walk you over right now, I live alone in a fairly remote area. Thank goodness I have family, I have friends, I, you know, I feel like I, I do get to interact. But I'm here and I need I, to, for me to connect. I have a, the messiest table you've ever seen over there. I'm doing an art project. It is so, it is a solitude, a reflective thing. I am connected to something bigger, which is, I guess you'd say the creation of what I hope will be beauty. <laughs> I hope it turns out. But the thing is, is that I'm, I'm not alone in that way because I'm, I'm connected. I love solitude as much as I love interaction. I need a balance. I love having a balance of both. When I have felt disconnected, and trust me, I have, I've noticed two things about the way I'm showing up in the world. One of them is I'm not allowing myself to do something I enjoy, like a hobby. You know, I grew up at a time where everybody had a hobby or more than one hobby, right? I, fewer people have hobbies right now. So something that I'm doing for the pure enjoyment of it, that's just an expression of who I am. The other thing that I'm doing that is so ironic is I'm using, I'm over depending on technology. I'm turning to technology too much for distraction or entertainment. Now I'm a neuroscientist. <laughs> I know what that's doing chemically for my brain. And I also know my brain will do more of whatever it's doing right now. And it becomes a slippery slope. When I do these things that give me that little jolt of happiness, I won. My vice is internet scrabble. There, I've said it. But I play the game. I'm, oh, I'll just do one more. And I end up feeling so disconnected. So I think the two things I'd want to say is, in solitude, we are cultivating an aspect of the self toward a greater good, right? As you would say, toward value creation. I am making art that maybe will make someone smile once it's hanging in their room. I'm giving it as a gift, this piece. I hope that they smile every time they see it. So it's bigger than me. It is part of the offering I want to make to the world. When I'm sitting there doing my whatever it is, I'm turning inward in a way that I could say neurochemically isn't all that great for me, but it's also disconnecting me. The, iron the irony is, and I say this in the book, I'm connected. And that was the big promise of all of this, right? You'll be connected. But we've used it increasingly to turn in. And I have to be fair to all of us, including myself, by saying some of the things that have happened in the last years, you know, COVID, all of this stuff, it's caused a lot of us to habituate to aloneness in a stressful way. Yeah. 5% changes. 5% changes. My 5% change was Scrabble. I'm, I'm, uh, how shall I say? I've been Scrabble, Scrabble sober for a week now. <laughs> And it was just before I can play a game, I have to do like, I have to do five minutes of physical activity, just five, go lift some weights, do some planks, stretch, turn on some music and, you know, goof off or something like that. Once I do that, I don't want to play Scrabble anymore. Nothing wrong with Scrabble, but it's, it's not my highest and best purpose. Let's put it that way. That makes sense. This is so insightful. So even when I'm spending time alone or in solitude, or I'm with others in the community, family, et cetera, in, in both situations, am I um, connected to something that's creating value? Um, or am I connected to something that is going in the other direction? And it can happen in both of those you situations. So, right. so, yeah. So There's it, no it, meaning in me playing Scrabble. There's no meaning. There's no larger context. In me doing something that feels joyful to me within, in me keeping my body healthy, in me doing a piece of art that will be a gift for a friend that I love, right? All of this is about that bigger context. And it brings me true satisfaction. 
That's wonderful. And the, the art piece of it for me is elevating emotional energy. I'm, I'm actually um, talking to you right now from my home music studio. So I write songs. It's been a power hobby of mine my entire life. It's how I made most of my money in the 80s. But imagine writing a song that elevates, you know, a if, uh, 100 people at, a, at an event or um, it's a song that a billion people listen to and it elevates their level of uh, um, emotional energy look at the impact we just had on it's amazing. the world with that I, right honestly, there are two or three songs that have literally changed my life so the creative gift that some person has you know from within themselves and i see us as all artists we we are all artists we we simply aren't taught you know stem learning don't even get me started because science technology engineering math love them they're fantastic but they're all this we have to bring in the steam of create of art and the creativity of it. You know, we are meant to be creative and expressive problem solvers. And even if that problem solver can comes out as a generous offering to the world through a beautiful song where, you know, a, a little earworm phrase from it just keeps running through your mind in a way that actually helps you see something in a different way than you might have seen it before. What a worthy way to create value in the world. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Ellen, if people want to know more about what you're doing, how how can they reach you? Yeah, thank you. Well, first of all, I try to make that as easy as possible. So I'll bet you do an episode page or show notes, something like that, for your podcast. We, we will at the end. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I think a really good way to to start is through the Brain and Beyond podcast, and you don't have to start at the beginning, although a lot of people like to. Uh, anyone who listens will hear I. Definitely have my training wheels on as a producer as I began this thing. I've don't lose heart. If you hear a few like shoes dropping in the first episodes, it gets better with time. You know, just the production gets better. But I think go in and take a dive on whatever the latest episode might be. Listen. If you like it, go back and listen to more. That's probably the best way to get to know me and come to find me because I, um, yeah, I'm, I'm here for it all. Well, thank you. And this has been uh, really insightful. You've helped me think a lot more deeply about this. And I could make a pretty good argument that this is probably the most important thing that all of us should be working yeah. on. Um, so yeah. this this is incredibly important. Thank you so much for thank being you here so today. Much. I really appreciate it. Great conversation, Lee. Thank you. And thank you to all the listeners out there for sure. Loved it. So uh, this has been the Show Your Value podcast where we explore the art of value creation around material value, emotional energy value, and spiritual value. And if you receive some value from listening to this podcast today, please like it and leave a review. And until next time, go forth and create value.